troubleshooting tips. Uh, a little about me, Arlie. this is just so you have it in your uh, slide deck. Here is an old fashioned, I say old fashioned because I don't use it anymore, but it's a, it's a decent way of doing a troubleshooting. And we're not gonna go down this path at all. It's nice to look at and there's a process you can follow. And a lot of companies in Microsoft and Cisco use something like this. But when it comes to Wi-Fi, I don't like using it because it doesn't solve our specific problems. So we have a we have this old story about Occam's razor. When you're faced with two possible questions, the, the simpler one's probably the best answer. But I found this this cartoon, and I think it's kind of kind of spot on, apropos for where we are. There's easy answers, and then there's the correct way, but it's a lot harder to go down that path. So we could go down the path of, well, it's, it's a Wi-Fi problem, fix the Wi-Fi. But if we find exactly what it is, then we can solve the problem a little easier. So a couple of years ago, I went through and found uh, there's lots of things that can go wrong with your network. The red stuff is the stuff that's on Wi-Fi. The blue stuff is the local network. The green stuff is out on the WAN. And any one of these, the if it fails, can cause the end user to say Wi-Fi is down. On the top right, I'm sorry, top left, where it says RF medium, the kind of the, the shaded area are things that happen in the RF itself. And those are fairly difficult to, to troubleshoot. You need to have specific tools to look in there, spectrum analysis kind. But in the center of that is the MCS process. And because MCS is the transmitter making his decision in real time, at this moment in time, when I'm going to transmit this frame, I'm going to collect the, the bits I need to send, but I'm going to format them with a certain MCS, with a certain speed, a certain bandwidth, a certain um, channel width, and then I'm going to try it. And so that MCS process is self-reporting on the health of that entire RF medium box. Below it is all the process of how a client actually joins the network and it eventually hits the AP, which is in, kind of in the center between blue and red. And it's the part that's going to take something from a wireless and convert it into a wired. Problems that happen on the local network, DHCP, UDP, ports, controllers, apps, DNS, those really don't have anything to do with wireless. Now, their effect is it might cause a wireless user to say something was wrong with wireless, but that's not really the root cause about it. Now, each one of these little bubbles has a line. Yeah, this is like overwhelming. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize this. Just to the right side are all the things that could go wrong that would cause that one bubble to have a problem. So we have lots of bubbles and they're organized here. And then each of those has what individual items could go wrong in there. And thus, back to Occam's Razor cartoon, troubleshooting Wi-Fi is pretty complex. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. First set of stuff that can go wrong has to do with the radio frequency. And there's a whole bullet list here, and I'm not gonna go through the bullet list, just to let you know, there's a lot of things that go on in the RF medium that will cause Wi-Fi to have issues. Again, the MCS part though is self-reporting. Another data point that I like to see here is retry rates, average data rates, uh, but we're on the client side troubleshooting? How do you help your end users get to it? And those two pieces of information, not really easy for the end users to get a hold of. But lots of things that could go wrong in the RF. Thus, I have to show a MCS chart, right, Jim? Every single slide has to have, you have to have this. Okay, if you don't have it memorized, I, I gave you a prettier one today. It also has OFDM rates on it. The idea is, every time there is a data rate, there is a corresponding set of spatial streams, modulation type, coding type, and guard interval type, as well as channel. So what's that? One, two, three, four, five things make up each of these individual speed numbers. And the clients, whether actually the transmitter, whether it be a client or an AP, will self-report where they are. And so we can use the MCS, if they're higher numbers, it, they don't have trouble with the RF, if they have lower numbers, they're having trouble with RF. So that's the simple way to look at that section. The next section, I've been calling the green diamond for 20 years because the very first graphic, and you can see it on the screen, I had a graphic designer do this graphic for me, uh, 2002 maybe? So it's been almost two decades old. And she happened to put, you, you can tell how old it is, that laptop has a PCMCI slot on the side. It's been a long time since we've seen one of those. But she just happened to use green as the color, diamond as a decision. 
But the choice of where to roam or which AP to associate can be as simple, and some, especially some older Linux drivers, all said, who has the loudest signal, go to him. But that's a, that's a too simplistic way. Clients don't act that simplistic most of the time. There's all these things on the right. There's a huge list here of parts that go into the algorithm that determine which AP I should join. Now, again, we're talking about the end users doing their own troubleshooting. So I'm kind of just glossing over these first two items because they're not, those are the things you're gonna troubleshoot. And users kind of miss a lot of this because it's kind of below their level of what they're looking at. But we need to know how that decision was made. But the end user can tell us which AP they associated to, and then we can assume what happened in the background in the algorithm to make them end up at that location. So here's the little zoom in on the association process. The client device on the left starts the association process, can go open, no encryption, straight to the upper layers. I like that top line. That top line takes everything else out of the equation. As soon as I'm associated, I authenticate with no authentication, it's open, and no encryption, and go straight into the upper layers. And I can talk directly to the AP. One of the easy, 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 I'll just say this is the first one. The easiest answer for having end users talk to you is get rid of all the complexities that are in associated with authentication. Have an SSID that just has open. I know it's not secure, it's stupid, why do we have those? But from a troubleshooting standpoint, if an end user is having trouble and you don't really know, is it Wi-Fi or not? Where is it, where's the problem? Just stand up a open SSID and have them hit that SSID. If they can go through that and go out, then you instantly know it's not the Wi-Fi because the Wi-Fi work cleanly. It's someplace in either the pre-shared key or usually in the, in the dot one X process. So that top line going straight across is an easy troubleshooting step you can implement to take the authentication parts out of the line. Now there's an entire, I mean, there's courses on how to troubleshoot and do dot one X radius and how all those choices happen. But from a, a simple standpoint, open just goes straight through. Now this is one I've been, been harping on for literally decades. In the wired world, we tell our people all the time when they have a problem, take your little cable, you plug it in. Did the link light go on? Because we know if there's a link light, we know what's not broken. We have uh, connectivity with electrons flowing down the copper from your client device to a switch port and coming back from the switch port, and it gives us the, that link light. Now, we've used that in troubleshooting wire for a generation now, saying, well, if we have a link light, then we know it's what it's not. It's not all the layer one, layer two stuff. We have a link light, but I still can get an IP address. Well, I might go start thinking down the HTTP path. Association is to wireless what a link light is to wired. So if you can get your end user to associate, you don't have to go down the stack anymore. You know it's working. In order to associate, that client device had to find all the APs, listen to their beacons, send out a probe request, get a probe response, decide which one they wanted to join with whatever algorithm they have, then send an association request, get back an association response, they're associated. All of that traffic went over the wireless. So we know the wireless level is working. Now, not be, might not be working at the speed or the throughput that you want, but we at least know it's not a layer one, layer two issue. So this, this is like your big number two. If you can associate, then you know it's not wireless, it's something else. So when a, a, this is just a, a, a different view of the same kind of thing. There's this 802.11 association, and then we have authentication, and then we get encryption, and then we have port control on the AP, and then we get to the upper layers, GHCP, VLANs, default gateway DNS, and then we can pass, pass traffic, and then we hit the captive portal. Yes, then. So another quick, easy way to, to tell your end users, if you see the captive portal screen, you don't have a wireless problem because the only way that showed up on your screen is you had completed all the other pieces. Even if there was uh, encryption or a PSK or a .1X and you still hit the captive portal, 
Now, usually you don't put a captive portal behind that one X, that would be stupid. But the point is, if you get to a captive portal, that means the AP is passing your traffic from the wireless client over the air to the AP, converting it into a, a ethernet frame, sending it out the ethernet port of the AP to the captive portal, wherever it's sitting. So a quick way to say is if you see the captive portal screen, you know you don't have a wireless problem. I know it's overly simplified, but it solves so many problems in my life. So let's talk about triage. To talk well about triage, let's go back in history, back in the Crimea War, the end of uh, the 1800s. British went over to Crimea, and hey, there's people in Crimea right now, also fighting the Russians. They were over fighting the Russians. And they had a, uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. They didn't do very well at all. Lost a lot of people. That was where the whole charge of the light brigade and the thin red line and all that. But it was also where uh, Florence Nightingale started nursing and changed the whole nursing career. Well, fast forward a generation later, later they're in uh, France in the trenches fighting trench warfare, also losing a lot of people, a lot of people getting hurt. But the, but the medical establishment in the British Army found that their death rates were actually higher than they were in the Crimea, which was not a good thing. That was, that was bad, and then it even got worse. And they wanted to figure out why. So they sent a bunch of doctors down to the, the army medical hospitals right on the front lines to find out what was going on. And what they found was uh, doctors, surgeons were of the upper classes, they were officers, and they would see one of their buddies who went to Sandhurst with them or at one of their private schools together and would take care of them first because they, they had a relationship, they wanted to take care of them. And what they found was the surgeons were making bad decisions. They were choosing to help a fellow officer over an enlisted person, not because of the medical needs, just because of a relationship. So the way they fixed it is they took uh, some old crusty nurses who could just stand there and, 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 and yell at the surgeons. And they made the surgeons stay in the surgery and they let the nurses go out and do triage. And what triage at that point was determining, can we save the life of this person? It doesn't matter what their rank is or what it is, is can we save them? So there's a whole flow chart and process there of saying, let's fix the ones we can fix and not worry about the ones we can fix. So this, that's just a little history where it came from, but how does this affect in Wi-Fi? Well, when you go to a doctor, you, they go in and they do these blood pressure, pulse, temperature. Every time you go to the doctor, they probably also weigh you. I don't know why. I know why, because they want to see if I gained weight. But and, and I don't think that's I didn't, I didn't want to put a fourth one up here, but blood pressure, pulse and temperature. They check those every time, because if these are off, they're a telltale sign of something else that's wrong in your body. If your temperature is elevated, you might have an infection. If your pulse is going higher, that's a trigger that something else is going on. Same with blood pressure. So in the Wi-Fi world, we can use the, the same type of triage. And we want to look at channel utilization, reach try rates, and MCS rates, because those three things tell us the health of your network, at least the RF side of your network. It doesn't tell us anything about your DNS server being down. But channel utilization, reach try rates, and MCS rates, they're all really helpful in knowing. And so for, well, literally decades now, I've been using these tools to troubleshoot my clients. The problem is this presentation today is on what about end users? It's really tough to get a retry rate out of an end user, even to tell them where to go. Same with channel utilization. There's some scanners we'll talk about that you can get a channel utilization number that they can report, but they can always report an MCS rate. Okay, maybe not always if they have windows um, and there's some workarounds there. Or there's an agent we might talk about from 7Signal along the way. So let's talk about things we can do with end users. A couple of years ago, I did a survey out to, oh, probably 15 companies to find out what their top issues were. And there's a whole bunch of them that had to do with uh, the end user just making wrong decisions. Is he on the right SSID? Did he put the wrong PSK in, the wrong credentials? Or even down to they didn't turn that little button to turn the Wi-Fi on. Then there's client issues that the client device has, and then infrastructure network issues. We don't expect our end users to look at the bottom two network issues or infrastructure, but they definitely have some issues of their own that they can fix. And then they can also see some things from their client's point of view. So this is the one that bugs me. So I made it a big, huge screen. Most problems that we get reported aren't wireless. They just aren't. 
it's because wireless is the interface that they're using to get to the things they want, to the web, to their applications, to whatever. And because of wireless drops, they say the internet is down. Uh, my wife says the Wi Fi is down when she's in the car and can't make a phone call. So you, I'm sure you've heard that as well. They just don't understand how the thing system works. So we need to be able to, to make the quick decision here. And this, that's why there's like two arrows. If it's a wired problem, there are wired tools. There are network connectivity tools, things we can use to help us fix a wired problem. If it's a wireless problem, there's a different set of tools we need to look at. And so this decision here, wired or wireless, is pretty critical. And I, I think we should get as close to possible as having the end users be able to tell this. If an end user can make this decision, it will speed up everything that happens after. So try to get your end users to know which side of this line it's on. Now, here is a, another one of these uh, eye candy ones. Here's all the things, actually it's not even all the things, it's a subset of the things that could go wrong on the wired side. Not one of these has to do with wireless. Any one of these things is broken, doesn't work, has an issue, they're going to say it's a wireless problem. Thus, we need to make sure we can get them to figure out which side of the line is on. There's a whole bunch here. Now, here is the simple questions. I tried to get it as simple as we could. First question, do you have an IP address? Now, we know from the previous little discussion and little slide with the open versus authentication, that once you associate, do ADOS live in association, and then encryption and important control, getting an IP address is on the upper layers. It has nothing to do with wireless. So if your client has an IP address, you don't have a wireless problem. It got an IP address. How did it get an IP address? It got it over the wireless, okay? So that's, that's like, boom, instant, wired wireless. If I didn't get an IP address, it could still be a wired problem, DHCP server down, AP is not connected. There's a lot of things it could be, but it's a telltale sign it might still be wireless. So if you have an IP address, can you ping your Wi-Fi client from someplace else? Now that's not gonna tell you whether or not your wireless is working. It's gonna tell you about your wired side. It's okay, it will help you troubleshoot. Can you ping from the client to something else on the internet? Uh, you might wanna have a, in your back pocket, just keep one in your head, an IP address so you can test DNS versus not DNS. So if you know the IP address of anything that stays up, just go and memorize, I don't know, cnn.com or some website you like to go to, have it resolved, figure out its IP address, and then ping that, and then ping the cnn.com. And if one works and one doesn't, then even from the client, you can quickly deduce as a DNS issue. I'm gonna hold MCS for off for a second. Oh no, let's just answer it. I've been talking about it all day. If you get MCS from the client's point of view, and they have a five or nine or better, that means they're getting 64 qualm or better, which means they most likely don't have any problem with their wireless. If they have less than five, they are having difficulty in that little RF box, the shaded red box. There's some trouble there. It might not be enough that it's causing another problem, but at least it gives you an idea that it's an RF issue versus not an RF issue. The ones on the right side, are then helping to troubleshoot and find out, is it this person alone? Is it everyone? Is it just now? All those other little, little things you can find out. Again, this little list here is very simple and you can have uh, someone on your help desk walk someone through this very quickly. Now, what kind of tools could we use? Well, we have command line tools. We have tools for Windows, tools for Mac, tools for Android, tools for iOS. There's app level tools, and then there's also agents that a couple of companies have that you put on the client device and let the agent do the work for you. First setup, command line tools. Now, I know most end users kind of freak out, but you can easily have a help desk person have them open a terminal and do a ping. It, sometimes I've had end users tell me that they're now, they're, they're like, yeah, I know how to program because they use ping. Uh, Ping is not one of my favorite tools. I think ping is a fantastic tool for testing network connectivity. It is useless for testing 
wireless connectivity. Because if I have an IP address, wireless is working. If I ping and it works, wireless is working. What it doesn't tell me is what's the quality of the wireless. Because ping's an upper layer protocol compared to our Mac layer and physical layer. So ping comes down and it comes down the stack and it tells the radio, please send this ping frame, which is a bunch of bits and they get turned into a code and the MCS choice makes its decision and it sends it out. Now, if it was the wrong decision for that RF environment, what's gonna happen, it's gonna try to send a ping and not get an ACK and then send it again and not get an ACK and send it again and not get an ACK. And then after, depending on the firmware you're running, it might run four or five, seven times, not get an ACK, then the client device goes, the transmitter device turns around and says, huh, maybe that MCS combination didn't work. Let me change the MCS. I might change the coding. I might change the channel width and try it again. Ping, no act, ping, no act, ping, no act, ping, no act. And it goes through until it finds, maybe it drops all the way back to MCS one. And it does the ping and it gets act. Ping goes, we're good. And so ping masks all the problems that happen at layer one and layer two. Now, if it works, that tells you that layer one and layer two work, but it didn't tell you about the quality of it. So a lot of these others are also useful in, in helping people at least read back to you what the problem is. So there's some command line tools, and those are available in Mac or Windows or iOS or Linux, whatever you like. On the Windows side, there's this net sh command, and there's a whole series here you can try. Uh, they're showing capabilities, interface, go play with these. I just gave them this to you so you can go and try. But it was also to lead up to a story. I like this story. It has to do with our community. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna go to the story and then I'll come back. There was uh, a guy named John Cosgrove, he's on the top here, and he read the Microsoft documentation for NetSH. And then he figured it out, I could put that in a loop and then walk around and it's going to show me the current status of my connection. And then every couple of seconds, it comes back and shows on the screen and I can use it as a poor man's uh, way to survey. Okay, worked pretty good. He wrote up how to do it. He posted his blog. Then Matt Frederick took his blog, read it and said, wait, I can, I can make that even better. And he took the same information, the same little loop that he had, and then added a lot more features to it and wrote a nice blog about it. So I gave you the link for the blog. Nigel then took that and said, oh, that was pretty cool, but I think I'm gonna turn it into a PowerShell script. So I don't have to just run a batch file I can run in the background. And he added more features to it as well. And then Peter McKenzie took what Nigel did and then ended up making an entire monitoring script. Let me show you what this looked like historically. First, there was just this little loop on the left and then down was the one that Matt Frederick fixed it. And then Nigel did the one in the middle and I didn't show, it's actually pages long. Nigel did a lot of work on that. And then what you see on the right is the result of what Peter McKenzie came up with. And he turned it basically into, it looks like a little app on your screen showing you the signal, signal strength. And there's a lot of weird math going on underneath <coughs> to calculate signal strength in percentage to DBM kind of thing. But this is an easy thing you can have your end users just run. So for those Windows users, you can either have them do any level of this process. I, most of my end users just like, you know, something that's a little simpler. On the Mac side, on the Mac, to get the same information, uh, bottom left, you can see what the, the CLI, the command line interface, I typed in airport dash capital I, and it gave me back this information. The RSSI, what state it's in, the last transmit rate and the max transmit rate, uh, by the way, you can use that ratio between the two to tell you about the health of the Wi-Fi too. That if you're not keeping as high as it's capable, there was some reason that the MCS dropped. Uh, above that, where it says Keith at the top, is if you're on a Mac and you hold the option key, then you hit the little boing, 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 the little wireless symbol, it will show you the same information from the same place. It's getting it directly from the same place. Well, a guy named Adrian Granados, then took that and turned it into an app. The app's called Wi-Fi Signal. You run it on your screen. Uh, and the big one in the center shows you what it shows on the screen. And not only does it give you the same information in a prettier way, the interface to the app allows you to do lots of configuration. You can show what it shows up on the screen at the top. 
I have mine set to show me the channel, the width, the current transmit speed, and my MCS right there on it's to the top of my taskbar all the time. And below that in the second line is the SSID of what I've joined. But you can configure that directly down below in the center. It shows you how I've got mine written and you can edit yours however you like. So Mac, this is back to that question of Mac versus Windows. I like seeing this on a Mac. Uh, one, I'm plotting on my screen MCS over time. That, a very useful thing. I can get MCS. But if you don't have a Mac, you have a Windows, the Windows ones we are. Now, how can we use this very simple little piece of information to troubleshoot our network? So here's another way that you can share with you. Story about this one. I was in Dubai at a place called the uh, Silicon Oasis. You know, we have Silicon Valley and Silicon, Utah, we call it Silicon Slopes and there's Silicon places. This is in Dubai, it's Silicon Oasis, brand new hotel and uh, called Premier Hotel and I'm the guest there. And you can see down below, I was running that same uh, Wi-Fi signal tool and my MBPS was 867, MCS 9. I'm, I'm hot. This is fantastic. It's doing exactly what I want. But when I ran a speed test, I got a one meg download. Now, that's 867 times less than I should have got. So I go to the front desk and I complain. So you something's wrong. And I didn't say there's something wrong with your Wi Fi. I said, something's wrong with your backhaul. And his first answer was, no, no, we have really a really good Wi Fi. It's brand new. And I said, I'm not at all saying you have anything wrong with your Wi Fi. Your Wi Fi is looking great. Fantastic. Great job. You spent your money well. What's your backhaul? And he looked at me and he goes, we have an E1. Now, for those of you in the US who have T1s, and E1s just slightly bigger than a T1, this was a 200 person, a 200 unit hotel, and they had a two meg connection. Yeah, that was obviously the problem. So even with this, just this little ratio, and I'm going to come back to this ratio, because if you can teach this ratio to your users, they can easily see in this picture, I'm getting 867 over my wireless, my wired, the uplink is terrible. So this ratio is a really good thing to teach your end users so they know is it wireless or wired. So scanner tools. Now scanner tools are not terribly expensive, depending on which one you have, some are free, some are uh, maybe even a couple hundred dollars, but compared to professional level tools, they're, they're way down. Uh, they come in Windows, Mac OS. Uh, my favorite for Android is one called Analyti. It's fantastic. I'm going to show you some slides in a minute. In iOS, we only have airport utilities. There's some legal reasons we can't run scanners directly in iOS. Uh, one, just sidelight timing. Last week, uh, Ubiquities came up with a little box that you attach to your iOS phone that because it's outside of iOS, it can do the scanning for you and then it can do the reporting. You can even use Ekadhow with a sidekick running RTFM and it acts like a scanner. On this point, before I move on, Devin Aiken wrote an entire troubleshooting course, a literally a two day full course, very detailed, and it's called uh, Wireless Adjuster. I give you a link there if you want to check it out. He teaches how to troubleshoot all your Wi Fi with nothing but a scanner, using only a scanner. Now, the reason I brought that up is one, you might want to go do it, not for your end users, it's way above what end users need. It's also, if you can see something in that, of how to use a scanner and you can tell your end users and users can also use a scanner to see what's going on so let's look at scanners scanners show basically and this is forever we've had these like literally as long as we've had wi-fi uh net stumbler was the first one that i used and it had the same kind of look there's a a, a table of network names bss ids the vendor the channel all this tabular information and then showing it with these little pictures. Now, if it was an 807B, it would be a kind of a rounded one because it has a different spectrum. Uh, but you can see them and you can see by their height how loud they are. And this is a very easy way to have an end user say, well, in this case, I should be on channel, uh, I don't know, 100 because nobody's sitting on channel 100. Or for the 24, you can see, well, given all that crazy, like there's one on here, my neighbor called, it hurts when I IP. And, and he's taking a 40 megahertz channel, so I can't use one or six. 
And so it allows them to quickly see what's going on. Most scanners also give you the ability to change the columns. And there's a little uh, thing up on the upper right that lets you see the column choices. So you can have them build columns. For most scanners, you can also save it as a profile, and then you can make it good for your end users and have them just apply the profile and then see the columns they need to see. This scanner, and, and I'm, I'm not, this is, happens to be Wi-Fi X4 Pro, and I'm not, I would like to push it, but they all kind of work the same. This one also has the ability to look in and see the elements inside your frames, especially in the beacon frame, and you can see whether or not things were supported. That's a lot of how Devin Aiken's wireless adjuster classes works because you get into the nitty gritty. So scanners, wonderful thing. They take a little more instruction to help your end users get to use it. The reason I like Analyti, the, on, the, on the top left, it's a Android phone. Analyti also works with six gig and Android phones are now six gig capable. And when you run the internet speed test, it puts it right in front of your face. My internet was 38 but my Wi-Fi speed was 150 of the 300 that was capable. In one little screen is showing you everything you need to know to say, is it a wired or wireless problem? If it was, I'm doing 150 out of 300, and that tells me like instantly, I have a one stream client and the AP is two streams. And I, he's saying I could do 300, but I can't do 300. That's my limitation. I also see that I'm sending 150 to the AP, sorry, I'm bringing down 150 from the AP, but I'm only getting 38 from the internet. So the slowdown here is not the Wi-Fi. And that's what we're trying to emphasize. Compare these two. And if your internet speed is slower than your Wi-Fi, then the Wi-Fi is not your bottleneck. So any complaint you have doesn't have to do with that. And also has some ping. Now, Analyti has lots of other tools. If you're running Android at all, strongly recommend you look at Analyti. It's got lots and lots of features in it. Does lots of other, does lots of other cool things. For iOS, this also works on Android. <clears throat> I don't know the technique it's using. It's and I've used it hundreds of times, so I have faith that it works, but I don't know exactly how. In this case, I was running a one on iOS, and it said my Wi-Fi was 143.4, but my internet was 143.4. So my Wi-Fi was the limitation. My internet might have gone faster, but it couldn't go any faster than the Wi-Fi. A lot of times you see it the reverse, where the Wi-Fi is faster, but the internet's slower. And that means I'm not the bottleneck. At this point, I know my Wi-Fi is the bottleneck, but I don't care. I'm getting 143 meg. So that's an issue. So both of these tool, again, easy to have your end users just look at the two numbers and do a little comparison. Last one I'm going to cover here is one for the rest of the network tools. Hurricane Electric makes this for Android and iOS, and it does all those other tools that you might, all the network tools. Remember that slide I showed all the things that go wrong with the network? Yeah, we have ARP and DNS and IP and perfing, and we have all those things. And they're also built into Hurricane Electric, a free tool. I like having my end users use this but only if I have a chance to teach them. The answers that it gives are probably above what most end users like. So key takeaways I wanted to cover. If you understand how Wi-Fi works, the difference between the red box of how RF is either congested or not, and that can be summed up by just MCS because it'll self-report. If you understand the association and if there's, you're having trouble, have an open SSID that cuts all that out. And then you can tell was it, was it really Wi-Fi or was it the pieces. I had a customer who was like swearing their Wi-Fi was broken. We set up an open SSID. Everyone's happy. And that's pretty obvious. It was your authentication server. And they're like, yeah, we just didn't want to, we wanted you to fix it. Well, then ask me to fix that. Well, that would have cost more. So people know, people know. And then when it comes to tools, you don't need to have your end users have, take a lot of tools. Just some very simple things basically to know, is it wired or wireless? And if it's wireless, is wireless having an issue? So that was my <gasps> fast delivery here. Questions? All right, thanks, Keith. And uh, a lot of uh, notes in the chat about uh, Devin Aiken's wireless adjuster course. Um, I've taken it and really enjoyed it. I think it's really worthwhile. 
and I see he's got a new course scheduled for December. So anybody interested in that, go check it out. I wouldn't have your end users go. No. That's (laughs) definitely drinking from the fire hose. Yeah, you are going to be drinking from the fire hose. But he will give you all the course materials, which is good. You can go back. I I was trying to talk to them and I said, you aim this at people who are post CWAP. He's like, no, 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 just CWNA. I'm like, no, you gotta, you gotta know the packet really well, but yeah, but it's a fantastic course. Definitely, definitely helps you learn to troubleshoot with just little pieces of informa- information. Yeah, and even if you're not CWAP or or post CWAP, you know there are those kind of best practices and practical yeah. things that that he uh, includes there. So very, very good one. A uh, question from uh, Marcy. So thanks for joining us today, Marcy. Um, and she asked, Keith, can you share an example of how a company trained their end users to be able to troubleshoot their Wi-Fi and how successful this was to drop uh, Wi-Fi help desk calls? Oh, yes, easily. Um, it was a, it's probably the simplest one. There's a medical clinic. They were using all Windows devices. They're having lots of issues. Uh, this is the Mac bigot in me. I had them switch all to Macs not because their their app was a it was a browser app it didn't need it but i needed it to fix their wi-fi and they kept not being able to fix their wi-fi issues i tried lots of things and they were at a refresh cycle so we had them switch all to mac uh, macbook airs actually at the time they were little 11s and they were lightweight they liked them and anyway but we we put on wi-fi signal and the change was wi-fi signals up in your taskbar and it has the MCS written right there. We just loaded the profile and had the SSID and the, and the MCS. We didn't even put RSSI, which we could have. It was just straight MCS. And if you clicked on it, it would show the, the overtime. And all we told them was, uh, if you think you're having a Wi-Fi problem, look at this number. If the number's above five, it's not a Wi-Fi problem. And all they changed, that was it. That was the only thing I taught them. And their help desk stopped getting calls for Wi-Fi. Now, it didn't help the problems with their browser, but they realized it wasn't the Wi-Fi. Don't say the words Wi-Fi to help desk, or they're going to start down one path of, of troubleshooting, which doesn't need to be done, and it's too slow. So their help desk ended up doing that. They ended up rolling it out. This was, I just worked with one medical clinic. They were part of a group. The entire group switched over and lowered 90% of their help desk calls because people were just like, it works. Here's a, another really easy one, and you all have one of these in your pocket. Doo-doo. So it was a hospital and they're complaining about Wi-Fi, terrible Wi-Fi. We had refreshed, we'd done it. It's supposed to be great. And all the nurses are still complaining. So take the phone, take the nurse and say, oh, we're gonna, this is gonna take a while. What kind of music do you like? And she's like, well, country. So I went to Spotify, found a country music station, put it in my pocket, turn on kind of a little background music as we're walking. And we're walking down. What I didn't tell her is, I also started a ping from my phone to the AP, down to her uh, cow, her computer on wheels. We're walking along and she gets to the spot and goes, see, Wi-Fi's bad. And I went, really? I look at my phone and the music's playing nice. Then I show her the ping and I explain to her it's going up down to your device. And my Wi-Fi is working on my phone. Your device is answering mine. We're talking back and forth right now. She goes, well, why, why did my screen ask for my password again? Well, that's a really good question. It has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi is working. My Wi-Fi is working. This space works. And what it was for that specific one, people, they would leave the nursing station and log in in the morning and then go to where they were working. And that distance happened to be the timeout for their password. It was a, they just changed the timeout and made all the, all the nurses happy. So. Nice. Nice. And that, that's definitely a common uh, experience in in, uh, in hospitals and with help desks. When an end user says Wi-Fi, the help desk records a Wi-Fi problem and sends it right to the network team. Um, and it's, you know, how was that identified? Well, the end user just said the word Wi-Fi. So yep. having a little bit up front can really be helpful, um, which actually might be a good time to transition because we've we've covered most of the questions here. So thanks a lot, Keith. And uh, Eric. Let me see to Eric think... and I'll read the chat while Eric's talking. Sorry, Eric. Yeah. He can come out of the shadows now. There he, there is. he is. 
It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Well, hey, guys, it's that time. It's time for Seven Minutes with Seven Signal, where we take a little feature inside Seven Signal, unpack it, and show you how it can have great value. Now, after today's session, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, my gosh, I wish, I wish, almost like a dream that I just had like these little Wi-Fi Explorer programs on all my MacBooks all across my thousands and thousands of devices that I have all over the world. And then the, I just wish that I could just log into a web page and I could see everybody's performance at just, you know, by a blink of an eye. Well, it's not a dream, guys. It's reality. Let me show you. I did set you up kind of nicely there, I have to admit. You did a great job. Eric's been chomping at the bit this whole time. <laughs> All right, you should be able to see that. Give me the thumbs up if you can. All right, guys, this is Mobileye. It's a little app or an agent that you push out to all of your devices, Windows devices included. You don't have to have a fleet of MacBooks, although MacBooks are very cool and very capable. But we all know that in the business world, we've got a mix. So what do we do? Not only that, but um, it's, I mean, we got people working all over the place remotely. What do we do? So we push it out, a little app runs as a service in the background, the user doesn't even know it's there. It does all of its Wi-Fi performance testing, and then it'll tell you the answer to the question, is it Wi-Fi or is it not Wi-Fi, with just a glance. Let me demonstrate. So these are all my devices that I have in my database here, as you can see. And we're gathering information with regards to make, model, operating system, the wireless LAN adapter, and the driver version. Very, very important. Why is this so important? Because I want to be able to identify what the issue is. Now, let's just say that my good friend called me up and he says, hey, Eric, I'm having some issues. Maybe he used the magic word Wi-Fi, maybe he didn't. But let's look at his device and get a closer look. So Laurent, he calls up and he says, hey, I got this new Surface. And, uh, you know, the name of my device is called Laurent Surface. So, okay, let's take a look. And it's going to bring me to his device page. The first thing I do, everybody out there, is I just look to the left. Is this a roaming coverage congestion or interference problem? All of the analytics are done in the cloud, okay? I don't need to ask Laurent to do anything special. I don't need to him, for him to install anything and do some kind of analysis. The analysis is complete. As you can see here, every few minutes, we're taking a snapshot of what is going on around Laurent's computer. And we can see how he has been kind of switching back and forth between 2.4 right there and then five gigahertz. We can also see on the right side of our screen how the, when the signal strength changes and the data rate changes, how it has a direct impact on the MCS that we're calculating for his Windows device. Yes, seven signal. Basically, because we can't get Windows uh, MCS, what we've done is we've reversed engineered it and we've now created an MCS enhanced called 7MCS. It's a simple score from zero to 11, which will tell you if any device, Android, Mac OS or Windows device is kind of dipping into that, uh, that cold zone below five where they dip down into 16 qualm, right? Uh, we don't want that. And so we can see right here very quickly and easily. And again, somebody could say, hey, I was having a problem yesterday. I was having a problem last week. This is all being recorded in the cloud. You can go back into your seven signal time machine and see what was happening on this person's device at that time, at that place. And so you can see how the signal strength, how it changes, they flipped back over to five gigahertz. And when that happened, their signal strength went into the tank at minus 78. Their computer's in trouble. What does it do? Oh, I'm gonna switch back to 2.4 and my signal strength is going to improve and my MCS is going to improve. But now I'm having to deal with the interference on 2.4. Guys, without this information right at your fingertips, who knows what to do? So we can see. Now, Keith was also talking about pinging. What's also important to note is that yes, we're pinging the gateway every few minutes in order to see Minute by minute, okay, do I have even just the most basic connectivity? All right, we're also pinging some things out on the internet. Again, do I have just the most basic connectivity? I just wanna cut the problem in half. Is it wired or wireless? And then also from a device standpoint, last thing I'll show you, we are also tracking CPU and memory utilization. 
Sometimes people will say that word Wi-Fi and we immediately think that there's something wrong. But look at this, guys, right here. I can see the memory in use. Okay. Now, the other thing I'll show you over here on the left is with regards to roaming. What's a roaming problem? Remember the little green diamond that Keith was talking about? It's, it's a mysterious thing. And check it out, guys. This is how we're able to detect a roaming issue, which is a client device issue. I can see your signal strength connected at minus 79. But when I look around the computer or when the computer looks around itself, it sees better option right here at minus 64. That is not a Wi-Fi issue. Tell the person, hey, look up. You see that little blue dot? Okay, the network is designed perfectly fine. Your computer made a bad decision. I'm sorry. It's just so nice to be able to say that when you have this evidence right in front of you with a timestamp. I then go over here to the left, lower left, and I see, whoa, you have this adapter. Okay, but man, version 22.50, that's a little old. How do I know that? Because I've got my handy dandy Intel or Intel link right here that indicates that it's we're on version 22.160 already. And I make the recommendation to upgrade the drivers in hopes that better roaming decisions ensue. So that's what I have for you guys today. Hopefully you guys can see how quick and easy with the proper systems and tools it is to troubleshoot Wi-Fi. So I want to thank you for joining us today. And I do, I want you to remember quite clearly that we can't see or hear Wi-Fi, but 7Signal can. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Heather, back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Wonderful as always. And Keith, thank you very much. Lots of great feedback already in the chat. Jim, thanks as always. And thanks to you guys. We would not be here without you. Um, so you know where to find us. Same time, same place next week, 11 uh, a.m. Eastern Wednesdays. And we will see you there. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.